Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because he lived, we live, and we can face tomorrow. Amen. 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 Thank God for his death, burial, and resurrection. Good morning to those in the sanctuary and on the corporate prayer line and virtual audience. Welcome to the Convent Avenue Sunday Church School, where the, we have the pastor, Reverend Dr. Jesse T. Williams, Jr., the senior pastor of Convent Avenue Baptist Church. Reverend Dr. Charlene Faison is the Ministry of Christian Education. And we have Sister Melody Miller, who is the supervisor of the Sunday Church School. Deacon Willa Tolson. Deacon Willa Tolson, he's the supervisor of Sunday School. And we also have Deacon Nelson Bradwell. Amen. So we'd like to welcome you to the church Sunday school. And I will just lift you up in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, it's in your most holy, precious name that you allow us to come once again, dear God, so that we may give you the praise, glory, and honor, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you did out on Calvary, dear God. We thank you, Lord, for, for just being alive today, dear God. We thank you for yes. your blessings, dear God. Thank Lord, you. if it wasn't for you on our side, where in the world would we be, dear God? We thank you, Lord, for life, dear God. And we thank you, Lord, for the ones that was able to come out, dear God. We are here just to glorify your holy name, dear God. Less of us, more of you. We yes. decrease so that you may increase, dear thank God. You, God. Lord, we thank you, Father God. We just want to glorify your name because we cannot thank you enough, enough dear God. Lord, if God. we had a thousand tongues, it wouldn't be enough, dear God. Yes. But we want to praise you anyhow, dear God. And we thank you again. Thank you for allowing us to come out to thank the house you. to worship you in spirit and in truth. It is in Jesus' precious name that I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Uh, good morning again, our facilitators. It's just the two of us this morning, but I will uh, recognize our sister, Letty Hartwell. Yes, amen. Who is so supported. This is Laura. She will be doing the lesson, teaching yes. the lesson. Yes. And I will be partake of it too. Amen. We're going to just glorify <laughs> God. This is all about glorifying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we, uh, our curriculum theme is the entire Bible in one year. And we're coming from uh, the book of Malachi. Now, we, this is the last book of the uh, prophets, of the minor prophets. We'll be closing out with this. And he's basically coming saying the same thing the other ones, you know, other prophets were saying. God gave him a message to tell the people, return back to him. Be obedient. You know, as you read the story, to, the lesson today, you'll find out that they were disobedient, especially when they was our you know, bringing their tithes and offering to the uh, sanctuary or the temple that was disobedient with that. And that wasn't what God wanted. They were bringing the animals, disease or blind or crippled, whatever, or the stolen ones. They just disobeyed what God was saying. He was very dissatisfied with that. And so when we think of ourselves, you know, even though we don't have to bring things, you know, food, uh, uh, crops to the uh, warehouse, but at that place, you know, that time, they had a place to store it. All their tithes and offer, they bought about 10% of that to the storehouse. But how does it relate to us today? We're supposed to still do the same thing there. Amen. To bring it to the church, you know, because the pastor has to get paid. You got the electric bill, the water bill, the upkeep of the church. Yeah. So we st that's still being obedient to God. Yes. And so this is what this is all about. And uh, so God was telling the people, if you return to me, I will return to you. Now, God wasn't disobedient. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It was the people. So uh, then Malachi let them know, so you need to get ready because, you know, you got to turn, you need to turn back to the Lord because there will be... Uh, so, uh, the prophecy will be, this one was prophesied. Jesus would come, they wanted him, wanted the people to get ready, get ready, be obedient. 
you know, to turn back and do what the Lord says, you know, and stop. Uh, uh, you know, they were still uh, marrying out of marrying uh, women that didn't uh, know the Lord. And you know what happens with that? If, you know, there are worship idols and they would do that too. And God was against that. And they still was taking things from the point. It was just so much going on there. And so uh, God called uh, Malachi to let these people know, to remind them of what they should be doing, just to turn back to him. When you uh, don't do what the Lord say, you know, there are consequences. And you'll find out, I don't want to go too much into what you're doing, into the teaching. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> you know, no. there are consequences when you disobey him. And then you go back to Deuteronomy, you know, there was curses. You know, if you went against God, you know, there was curses. You're going to be cursed. You know, since there was, this was an agricultural uh, society, mm -hmm. their crops, you know, either the, uh, the bugs or the locusts would eat it up or they wouldn't have rain. So God was telling them, you must turn back. You have to turn back, and he will be a blessing unto them. So there was curses and blessings. You honor God, he will honor you. Amen. Amen. So, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, like I said, the lesson title is Return to a Just God. The focal verses of Malachi 3, 1 through 10. And the lesson aim is to, uh, you going to do the lesson aim? Right? Yes, I'll do okay. the lesson aim. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. But if you can do the script, you can do the focal verses. Yes, I, okay. Thank you. Amen. I'll be reading the focal verses from um, King James Version. Okay. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come and saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who will stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purify of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an orphan in righteousness. Then shall the orphan of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in the former years. And I will come swift, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false hirelings, in his wages, the wisdom and the fearless, the widows and the fear fatherless, and that turn against the strangers from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinance, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But as, as ye said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yes, have, um, have robbed me. But ye say, wherein has I robbed you? And tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me herewith with the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out your, you a, out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. So Malachi, the topic for today is Malachi, return to a just God. And Deacon Sally, thank you for reading the focal verses. So the aim for change says, by the end of the lesson, we will analyze Malachi's prophecy about possessions, wealth, and hospitality in light of our faithfulness and justice. Confess personal unfaithfulness to God and institute a personal charitable living plan. So this is what um, our Focal Voices um, talks about. So we just, I just wanted to talk about how does Malachi fit into the Bible? Malachi is the final book of the 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. And so the 12, these minor prophets were not minor because they were less inspired by God. 
but they were, or they had less important information. It was only because the prophecy that were given was just shorter. So they had the same message as the, even the major. They may not have had much, but the prophecy was shorter. And the Bible shows us here that during the, as we were studying the minor prophets, it had the same team, right? That Judah had gone into exile because of their disobedience to God. And so they were in exile for 70 years. And once they returned from captivity during the time, and there were the prophets, Haggai, which we studied, and we also studied Zechariah last week, they were finished rebuilding the temple. And, after, and so they had started rebuilding the temple and they were finishing doing that. But another 60 years, Ezra had arrived to restore the law. So we're looking at a span of time, which is not really short, right? It's very long. And then he was followed 13 years later by Nehemiah, who oversaw the building of the new wall of Jerusalem. So it, when we think about what the occurrence in Jerusalem was, it wasn't a short period of time. It was over a length of time when these prophets came to do the repair for in Jerusalem. So during Malachi's time, the Jews had been back in the land, and they had been there for 100 years. And so the temple was rebuilt, and Jerusalem had been restored. But as usual, Israel became complacent. They went back to their same old ways. Mm -hmm. They started not giving great offerings to God. They started having not giving the tithes and offerings, as Sister Sally said. Um, the customs was not being, um, uh, uh, being adorned to. They weren't doing that. And the priests, who God really loved and took care of, wasn't upholding his ordinance. They weren't preaching, they weren't teaching the covenant, they weren't keeping up with teaching the new culture and the new people in the land. And so Malachi said that God had accused the people and that they were doing, because they were doing wrong things, they did not give their best to God. And this is covered in Malachi 1, 16 through 14. Um, they gave inferior animals, they, were, they offered sacrifices that were lame, blind, spotted. And we know God asked for our best. Not only then did he, does he ask for our best then, he asked for our best now. We give God the best of our first fruits. That's just what we are called to do. And so they weren't doing that. And on top of that, they started intermarrying. So not only were they intermarrying with people outside of their culture, which it's talk in the, in the covenant that they, that was something that God had told them not to do. And not only did they marry outside of their culture, they adapted to the culture of those that they married. They began to worship idols. They began picking up the same type of culture. And it clearly stated in the Mosaic covenant that that was something that was abomination to God. But they did it anyway. And then the men would just divorce their wives without a reason. I for no reason at all, and they didn't give a reason, they just did it. And this is covered in Malachi 2, chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And most importantly, it talks about the size of giving a tent, which was supposed to be the amount of their income that would annually be donated to support the temple and its priests, a practice that was laid out in the Torah in Leviticus 27.30 and Deuteronomy 12.6. So this they knew about. They knew that this, that this had to be done and they didn't do that. You have to remember that when the lands was being distributed to Israel, the priests didn't get any land. The, the Levites didn't get any land because God wanted him, them to be faithful to him. So they would take care of the temple, and so they won't allow allotted any amount of land. So when the tithes and offerings is what they would bring annually, and I think once every three years, when they stopped doing that, God Temple went into disrepair. The Levites won't be in the priests won't be in taken care of. And so this is what happened during that time in Malachi's days. 
So however, we know that in Malachi and Nehemiah 13, chapter 13, 10 through 11, that the people had neglected this responsibility of the temple and it totally fell into disrepair. God confronted them by saying that while he wanted to bless them abundantly, he will only do so if they were faithful. So we know that when we're faithful to God, God is faithful to us, right? Amen. God clearly says that. Mm -hmm. And so that was just the summary I wanted to give about Malachi and how he fits into the Bible. And so if we go through our church school book, we notice that they broke it down into like three different categories. In the first category, it talks about the messenger of God and it's taken from Malachi 3 verses 1 through 4. And I will break it down pretty much verse by verse. So if we can just, I'll go through that. Um, so the first verse says, look, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, look, I am sending my messenger. He will prepare a way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's army. So if we look at this particular verse, the Jews were accusing God of neglect. Could you imagine? <laughs> they were doing all the things that were wrong, and yet God remained faithful, but they were re accusing him of neglect. So God points them to the future, and he talks about, he talks about how, how he would identify a messenger that would come so that because Jesus was identified as the person that would come as the Redeemer and the Messiah, he was sending John the Baptist. And so in Matthew 10, Matthew 11, verse 10, the future messenger was clear, would clear the way in preparation for Jesus. So God didn't even talk about why is he being neglectful. He's saying, look, you're not ready because you're not behaving in a way that I approve of. But here, until you get ready to receive me as a Messiah, I will send a forerunner to get you ready for when I come. And that's what this, this first verse covers. John the Baptist. Yes, it was John the Baptist. And so when we look at the second verse, it says, but who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be a blazing fire that refines metal, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will, he will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. So the explanation pretty much for this particular verse, this is verse two and this is verse three. And it says that when God come, who will be able to stand before him? Because we are imperfect human beings and they weren't performing the way acceptable to God. And so God is saying that the prophets who foretold about this time will talk about the day of judgment. God said that he will meet them at the day of judgment when he will judge the whole world and, and it will be marked by disaster and death. And Isaiah 2.12 covers this, so does Zechariah 1, 14 through 17. And here Malachi said, no one would be able to endure his coming because he would purify the priesthood, which he needed to because they were giving on Animals. Yeah, they were giving diminished, diminished animals. They were not being faithful. And so the sacrifices that they were giving was unacceptable. So as fire, he would burn up the impurities of the priests and the laundryman's soap would be washed, with, would wash them as clean. So Deuteronomy 4.29 does explain this. And so the Leviticus priests with the cleansing of what God was putting, would do with them 
he will be able, they will be able to offer sacrifices to God rather than as what they were doing in Malachi's time because they were being disobedient. So they needed to go through this cleansing. And so when, so that, and so when they, sh so that when they show contempt and show, and their offerings would defile with this cleansing, they would be able to turn back, as Sister Sally said, to God. And so we go to the last chat, the last verse of the messenger of God, and it says, then once more the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem, and he did as they did in the past. So after the cleansing, which I just mentioned, the priests of, the priests of Judah and Jerusalem, which is basically all of Israel, would be able to offer sacrifices that would, please, that would please the Lord in contrast to what they were doing then. And so they would be acceptable like the offerings the priests offered earlier in Israel's history before the priesthood had become corrupt. So even during the time that they were corrupt, you know, God doesn't order, doesn't honor disobedience. And so because they weren't doing the right thing, God couldn't accept their sacrifices, and they had moved away from it. They were pretending that they didn't understand what the covenant said, and maybe some of them didn't, but some of them did. And so the things that they were given unacceptable sacrifice, marrying um, different cultures, divorcing their wives without without any reason, and not only that, they weren't treating the widows and the poor fairly. And so these things were acceptable to God. So Israel actually felt as though, because they were keeping these customs, even though they weren't great customs, they really weren't good, they weren't following what God said, they thought as long as they kept up celebrating your annual this, the annual feast, that they were doing what they were supposed to do as far as God was concerned. And so God was like, no, there needs to be a cleanse and there needs to be an accountability. We need, you guys need to turn back to me and when you do, I will honor that. Mm -hmm. They were also starting to feel that God was not working with them because there were so many evil people that were succeeding. Some oh, evil yeah. people were getting rich and that because they were stealing and everything else, they were doing everything wrong. So some of these people started to think, well, you know, if God is giving them a blessing and they're getting so wealthy, why should I? Why should I be doing this and I don't have nothing? So they were starting to do a lot of evil things because they didn't think that God was being just to them, and he was letting the evil people become wealthy and successful. We have the same attitude today. Absolutely. That's right. That those who are evil and making a lot of money are well off, and those who are poor and suffering are going through a lot of misery. You know, but God has an answer to all of that. It's like you said. Yes. Because there is one thing that you have to remember. Judgment is mm -hmm. coming. Amen. That and is then, so true. So then the people will understand what they could miss when they don't find out that God is not with their side. Mm -hmm. the, God amen. Will stay with you as long as you're doing what he wants mm -hmm. to do. Well, God said he has a day for the wicked. Nobody's getting away with anything. He sees everything. He, he, sees he hears and everything. All. That's amen. right. Amen. 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 And that is so. That you're being left out because somebody is getting richer than you are and, and you know them as being evil, whatever. Mm -hmm. don't, don't worry about don't worry that. About it. God will take care. Let's keep honoring God. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. He got Amen. Something. And I'd rather spend time with an eternal God for oh, yes. eternity 
than worry about my witches here on earth because this is only temporary. Yes. Right? And it, God is such a great God that he levels the playing field. It doesn't matter how rich you are here on earth or how poor, when you leave, you leave with nothing. That's right. You can't take it with you. Can't take it this with you. This is only temporary for while you're here on this side of the river. Can't take it with you. So true. So true. So the next section in our church school book says, a message of God, and it's taken from Malachi 3, verses 5 through 7. And it reads, at that time, I will put you on trial. I am eager to witness against all sorcerers and adulterers and liars. I will speak against those who cheat employees of their wages, who oppress widows and orphans, or who deprive the foreigners living among you of justice. For these people do not fear me, says the Lord of heaven's army. And when I read this text, I said to myself, oh my goodness, this does not only apply to Jerusalem, it applies to us today. Amen. Everything yes. that's in this text, we can relate to, right? So yes. we do have an immigration problem we can relate to. Mm -hmm. And we do have people that don't pay, pay people fairly. If you're not legal in this country, you won't get sometimes that $16 an hour that's mandated in New York to pay your employees. People do take advantage of folks like that. Yeah. And so it, the same thing that applies then applies now. So we can relate to what's happening in Judah then what's happening around. We just have to look around and see the same thing is happening, even in our country today. So at the time, the Lord assured the people that he would draw near to them, but, would be, but it would be on judgment day, right? Mm -hmm. So he would quickly judge all types of sin that they practice, where, whereas Mike, in Michael's day and now, God will wait. Right? And why God is waiting because God doesn't want us to end up not being able to go to heaven and be with him. God wants us to be able to come to him. He's waiting. He's waiting for that day when we turn and come to him. So he doesn't want us to just be go, go to damnation. He wants to be able to say that we love on him, we loved him, he loves us, and we can draw to him. And so that's the reason why he waits. This, this, the scripture talks about that. Say a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is just like a day in God's sight. He don't want anybody to perish because nobody can stand his wrath. So true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So the Levites are not the only people that would be judged. We'll be judged as well. Oh, yes. And so he would judge them for all the activities such as sorcery, adultery, lying, oppressions of, empl of employees, widows, orphans, mistreatment of foreigners, even all of the forms of contempt for him. This was his answer to their claim of him being unjust. So he's saying, I'm giving you enough time to change your mind, to turn, and come back to me, but on judgment day, you will be judged for all the things that you've done. So it doesn't only apply to Judah's time, it applies to us as well. God looks on, God looks on the heart. He know who is faithful, he know who is pretended. So this is the time right now, but you know, tomorrow might be too late. That is true. And so, we must stand before Christ and be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Mm -hmm. That's for us that are, for those that are unbelievers and who don't believe in Christ and who worship another God and think that God doesn't exist. Yeah, that would be the judgment when God comes on judgment day. And so, in verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. That is why your descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. 
And so I really like this text. And the reason why I like this text is because um, God is the same yesterday, today, and he will be forever. The change comes when we change. We are the per people that change. Judah changed. Jerusalem changed. But God is the same. God doesn't, doesn't change at all. And what I do like um, about what Letty did last week, and she showed how we started off as sin, and then we don't turn 360 degrees, but we turn 180 back to God. That turn back to God, God has al was already standing there. He's yes. already waiting there. He mm -hmm. did not move. He's just waiting for you to move. That's right. Just like he's waiting for the people from Jerusalem and Judah to move. So he's waiting. He's standing. We're the ones that change. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that change. So when we turn from sin and we turn back to God, God is just standing, waiting, waiting. whatever posture he is doing, just waiting for us to come back to him. And that's so wonderful about God. And so the Lord doesn't change his moral character. God is a God of love and mercy. God doesn't change his law, what is morally wrong and morally right, will remain wrong and right forever. Because God will not change what is wrong, he, God would not change what is wrong to right. The only reason people do not perish is because God's character doesn't change. Mm -hmm. God reminds the God, God remains the God of love who forgives and restore fellowship with remnant with repentant sinners who turn to Jesus Christ in faith. Mm -hmm. The statement that God doesn't change in 1 Samuel 15, 29 may seem to contradict other statements that the Lord changed his mind in Exodus 32, 14. This statement that God does not change refers to the essential character of God he is always holy, loving, just, faithful, gracious, merciful. The other statement that God, the other statements that he changes, that he changes refers to him changing from one course of action to another. They involve his choices, not his character. Mm -hmm. If he did not change his choices, he would be unresponsive. Mm -hmm. he, if he changed his character, he would be unreliable. And since God doesn't change, we know that we can trust what he says he's going to do, and we can, we can pretty trust anything because he's perfect. He's a man that, who cannot lie. That's, right. That's who God is. Mm -hmm. And so... As we move into verse 7, the scripture says, Ever since the day of your ancestor, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now, remember, now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's army. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone any way? But they did go. <laughs> they did, every, mm -hmm. they did yeah. everything that was wrong and corrupt. Amen. Yes, they did. You know, they did everything. Mm -hmm. They thought that keeping their, their culture or the annual mm -hmm. festivals and different things, that mm -hmm. they had done nothing wrong. But if they had studied which they had stopped doing, the Mosaic Covenant, they would realize that they had moved far away from God. Yes. And God no longer had that type of relationship with them. The response of the people was that they did not know how to return. Well, how could you not know how to return? You had a covenant. God gave you that. Mm -hmm. Didn't go anywhere. It was still there. You just choose not to obey it. So for them to say that they didn't know was, to me, I felt as though they were using an excuse as to 
well, we didn't go anywhere. We're still doing the same things we're accustomed to doing, but you weren't doing it the way God wanted you to do it. And so, yes, they had moved away from it. They had left God out of it. They was they doing their own God. thing. Yes, yes, yes. What was pleasing to them. And so the question was, how, sh how should we return? And the people, in effect, are saying, we need what we need to do to have, what do we need to do to have to return to God? That's what they were asking because they actually didn't believe that they had done anything. Mm -hmm. Brother Ron, you have a question? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. So Brother Ron said that comparing to during Judah's time and our time is a little bit different because the people had to go to the temple to the priest who would read them what God has said, what the covenant was covering. And so if they didn't go and they didn't hear from the priest, most likely they weren't aware of what the word of God said. And so with, as compared to today, we have so many vehicles and so many median to study God's word, Bible, electronically. And so he, he pretty much is saying it could be possible that they didn't know, but we don't have an excuse for saying that we don't. Just like now, we have Sunday school. And everybody have a book? And Ron gave out good information, so we could just open our books and study. Yes. You know, follow through with us. So just Amen. like you said, there is no excuse. You no know? excuse. So, as we move into our last section on our Sunday School book, it says, the maintenance of God's house. And I love, 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 love this section. <laughs> <laughs> and it's taken from Malachi 3, verses 8 to 10. And it says, should the people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When, we, when have we ever cheated you? You have cheated me of tithes and offerings Do me. You are under a curse, for your, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will open the window of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. It says in the New Living Translation, try it, put me to the test. So could you imagine God saying that to them? He's saying that, here it is, previously in this book, Malachi had accused the priests of offering the disease and worse animals to God in a sacrifice instead of the types that God had commanded them to offer. Animals without ble blemish, God wanted their best. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament law, God requires the people to bring 10% of their produce to the Levites, which is um, also referenced in Genesis 14:20. As an offering, the Levites would give their 10% to the ones serving as priests because people were 
because people were not doing this, God declared they were robbing him. God's people need to trust in God and know that we, that we can also love God and his people. Love will often motivate giving more than 10% to God and his people, more than 10% of your personal time, your talents, your gifts, and your treasure. So it's not only, the tith it's not only just the tithing, it's that as well. And so what God has done is, is that he's saying that because you're not doing this, the priests cannot, weren't able to be supplemented with what they needed. You couldn't give to the people, the poor, the foreign people, your orphans, your widows, because they weren't giving. And it's important to, to build God's house up. The same thing that applies to them applies to us. Amen. God is only asking for a 10%. The other 90% is yours. Mm -hmm. And if you love God, and there are things that come up in the church today, you should be supported of it. If our pastor supported, we should support it. Amen. That's the shepherd of our house. Amen. We should be in line with what he, does, what he wants us to do. And the same thing happens here in Jerusalem. They didn't give. And because they didn't give, God's house became in disarray and people weren't being able to help. Won't be, won't, be, won't, won't being helped. And so God called them out on it. He challenged them. He says, try it and mm -hmm. test me. And so when you do that, God says, you will see how much we will, he would make your life abundantly rich. And not only rich in things, could be in health, your family, your job. God is a God that keeps his promise. What he says he's going to do, he is going to do. And that's what this part of Malachi is all about. And so I want to leave you with a final thought. I wrote it down. Anything you got to say? Yeah, I just want to say this was... Uh, this was given to the people in the Old Testament that God would uh, bless them if they, you know, obeyed him. That means he would uh, send rain when rain was needed. And he would make sure the insects didn't come and eat up their crops. This was given to, he would bless them just by giving them what they need. And it applies to us right now, you know, that when we give tithe and, you know, our tithes, you know, people can be blessed and we do it because, you know, Maybe one day they'll be able to give. If we do it with a joyful heart and give of ourselves first, and then, you know, we'll give without being grudgingly given. We're going to give God our best. That's what God did for us. He gave us his only begotten son. Yes. So Amen. that's what we should do. We Amen. should follow that through. Yes. So I just wanted to leave you with this final thought. Um, so there was 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so, as far as we know, God didn't speak. There was no scripture written. The 400 years of silence began with the warning that closed out the Old Testament, and it's from Malachi 4, 5, and 6, which reads, Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord's arrival. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. And so it also ends, Malachi ends, with the coming of the forerunner, which was John the Baptist, to prepare a way for the Lord. And that's how it transitioned from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Amen. 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 Get lesson. Great lesson. You're going to close out yes. the prayer? Yes, yes. So let's close out in prayer. So Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and we're so thankful, Lord, for this time to come together to study your word, Lord God. Heavenly Father, we are so, so thankful that today is Resurrection Sunday, God, because if it wasn't for you, Lord Jesus, we would be nothing, Lord God. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. But today, Lord, we can 
celebrate and rejoice that we serve a risen Savior. And dear God, so we thank you and we worship you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wonderful job. Wonderful job. Amen. I'm so proud of you.